Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I hope you are all doing well. And uh, Michael and I are doing fantastic. Um, we are starting um, to get everything cleaned up outside. Um, we had a mess with the, uh, the ice storm that came. So we're clearing up the front and the backyard. It's starting to look really pretty. So we're getting ready for spring and for the summer. So life is pretty good right now, thank goodness. On today's topic, I wanted to talk about something that was on my mind for a while. Um, I am not in any stretch of the means a Sasquatch expert. I don't know if anybody can be a Sasquatch expert. I think there's people who have been dealing with cryptids. Uh, they actually have gone out and explored and um, researched and looked for uh, contact. And those people I applaud and I greatly respect. And I think they are the ones who probably I would consider more of an expert. But I've only been specifically working with Sasquatch or in contact with Sasquatch for eight years. So I'm not in any way someone who has been doing this for years and years, not like Michael and not like a lot of his friends who've been in the field for many, many years. But I do have a message and I do have some concerns about what's happening with people's interest with Sasquatch. And I don't like to call them Bigfoot because I've always thought, well, how would humans feel if <laughs> someone said, hey, big nose <laughs> or hey, um, big booty or whatever. I don't, I know their footprints are big, but I just, I've always got the feeling that um, that's kind of a silly thing that humans do. We kind of give everybody little nicknames and stuff. I also heard down South they call Sasquatch boogers. And I don't like that. Um, a booger is something that comes out of your nose. And um, I don't even understand how that that nickname came about. I don't even really want to know, but I do know that I just think that you have to give respect to beings who are not us or, or it's anybody. You have to give respect to anybody who is on this planet um, who's living and minding their own business and doing what they need to do. Um, I think the one thing that I want to talk about is kind of this idea of going out and trying to contact Sasquatch and looking for some type of contact and how people are going about and doing it. I think that there has to be some kind of respect when you go out into the forest, not only because it has to do with a place where they live, it's like their home, but because I think there's other elementals, there's, there's the paranormal in, in the forest that we don't even know of. There's probably things that hide from humans. They've learned to hide because uh, humans can be probably the scariest thing in the forest at times. Now, I'm not trying to say that there's not scary things in the forest. There is, and plus there's wild animals as well. So there's a lot of things that you have to watch out for. But for me, I think humans can be some of the scariest people in the forest. Um, and I think you have to go in knowing that you're a guest. And I don't ha ever have the idea of when I'm in the forest that I go in and it's mine. It's something that is my God-given right to go hang out and, and be in. I am appreciative and respectful when I go in because I know that it's probably... Uh, it's different areas are the locations of where Sasquatch probably hunts and resides. And so I want to be kind of respectful of that. And if we're going into an area where there's known Sasquatch sightings, Michael and I try to put out the mindset first um, in an empathic way, just kind of like that, that mindset of we come in peace and we're, we're, we're focusing in on trying to get contact in some way. 
as we're going to our destination. And then when we're there, uh, we bring offerings of apples and chocolate, dark chocolate. And uh, we found that uh, the female Sasquatch, Warja, loved the chocolate. And so that was great. So I, I, I loved giving her the chocolate. But we established a relationship with her and with another Oregonian Sasquatch, Loki. So it's not, I didn't ever get the, the feeling that she expected it every single day or uh, not every single day, but every time we went to go visit her, I didn't get the feeling that Warja or any of the Sasquatch that we were trying to get in contact with expected the apples or expected the chocolate or the nuts or whatever it is that we brought. I always got the feeling that they appreciated it. So I come from a different mindset that if you give little offerings and little gifts to the Sasquatch, that they'll they'll expect it every time. I don't I don't get that at all. I think that just like uh, friends who maybe will bring over a bottle of wine or maybe um, flowers. Every time you invite them, you don't expect a gift. It's just they give it to you when they they appreciate the friendship or whenever they want to. You don't say, oh, by the way, every time you come to my house, you have to give me a gift. Uh, we wouldn't have any friends if we did that. So I think that in regards to that, um, I found that, I, and I've sensed it's a little bit different with um, Sasquatch in that regard. Um, I, I think something else that is, is interesting um, is I, I look at them as forest dwellers. I, I don't look at uh, Sasquatch as some tribe of, of beings who, and they are, they, and Loki told me that they consider themselves tribes that they, they just kind of roam the forests. I think that they, they um, have specific areas that they go to. They know these locations. Borgia told me that they have a winter camp and a summer camp. And that makes sense. And that's something that humans do. So I think that when it comes to understanding when you're in the forest, understand that that we exist with other beings. And I'm not thinking that you, whoever's watching this, that you don't know this already. It's just that there are some people who maybe don't know anything about Sasquatch who think that they're wild animals and they are not wild animals. And I don't know why anybody has this idea that they are. I think humans relate everything in this world to how they see other humans and how they communicate with other humans. You can't do that in the paranormal. It just doesn't work. The rules are different. Um, with cryptids, it's entirely different because with Sasquatch, not all of them are just earth bound beings. They, some of them are portal jumpers like Loki is a portal jumper. And he was the first Sasquatch that got in contact with me. So I, I think we have to understand that they have a right to be in the forest just as much as we do. And I think humans have this idea that they're the top of the food chain. And, and I think there's always something that's um, out there that, especially in the paranormal, that probably hunts us. I don't think Sasquatch hunts us. I think what Sasquatch does is they're very cautious and wary of humans. So I think that's something that is, is important for me to say is I don't, I think that they've learned to be weary of humans. And so um, if there, there is certain contact where it's in the negative side, it's probably because they've had never negative experiences beforehand. Now with Loki, he explained a lot of things to me. He wanted a lot of help in regards to um, getting the word out to everybody about what he does and what his tribe, what they're all about. Uh, he's, 
hasn't talked to me in quite a while. Oops. Hey, you guys. Okay, okay. Hey, be nice. Be nice. Sorry. <laughs> the cats were uh, playing with each other. That happens sometimes. You guys be nice to each other. Okay. So anyways, getting back to Loki, um, because I wasn't able to get the information out, um, and then sometimes he would talk to me at two o'clock in the morning, sometimes he would talk to me at, um, he'd wake me up and, and he'd have information he'd want me to start writing down. Um, I would just, sometimes I just couldn't wake up. It was just really hard. So, I think that because I couldn't do the work that he needed me to do, that he kind of went off and started contacting somebody else. I did the best that I could, but that that's always made me a little sad is because I was not able to keep in contact with Loki the way that I would, would love to. And I've, op I've opened up and said, hey, I am ready to do whatever you need me to do. And I haven't heard from him. So that's that's unfortunate. But when Loki came to me, he talked to me about a lot of different things. And he, he told me that, um, they have, they are weary of, of certain groups in the forest. The Sasquatch doesn't, I don't think that a lot of them have this idea that they um, they don't look at the forest like we do. They they I think they exist in the forest and they forage and they 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 raise their families and they have their shelters and they do everything that we do. I think they they have emotions of love and they have emotions of of pain and hurt. And that's just what I was told. And I, uh, the one thing that Loki told me is that they have their, their, their way of existence that is, is similar to humans because I don't think they view themselves as, as um, a different, it's very different from humans. I think they view themselves as a group of beings that are maybe like, very connected to humans and maybe there, um, through DNA, maybe there's something very similar there that we have with each other. And I think that really is the case. I think that's true. The one thing that Loki told me was that uh, they, the tribes live primarily in the Rocky Mountains in the United States. Um, and they um, are in states, you know, obviously like here, they're everywhere. They're in, in, in many, many different states. Um, but his group, they like the Rocky Mountains. And so I think there's, there are specific tribes who like specific areas, just like humans. Like I like the mountains. I've always loved the mountains. I'm not a fan of the sea. So I, you know, I don't live places in the past. I haven't where I'm like right there by the ocean. That's not something that I want to do. Uh, but the mountains, you know, I'm a mountain girl. So there, there's tribes of Sasquatch that live lots of different areas. There's some who um, live down south who are more swamp areas um, like um, Arkansas and Louisiana. Um, uh, I think the, there's others who um, probably like it a little further up into areas that are isolated. Um, less human contact, the better for them. Others like the ocean. And I think there's some tribes that have learned how to live their lives around human encroachment. But I think that's something else that we have to consider too, is that every time somebody goes up into the mountains and builds a house, that might be in an area where a Sasquatch tribe or a couple of Sasquatch used to go hunting. And so once humans kind of just think that they have the right to take over certain areas, then what is Sasquatch going to do? Um, they can get angry about it, of course, and sit, but you know, if a human's going to build a house and they're building it, they're just going to have to figure out how to work around that. I, 
think that Sasquatch understands how to connect with humans, how to exist around humans. And I think at this point, it makes sense that they, they want to have more um, of a friendship. I, I think that they're weary of obviously the mindset of humans, especially some of the, the, the researchers who go in and want to make contact or actually want to go hunt them. And I don't really understand why anybody wants to hunt Sasquatch. Would we like it if somebody wanted to hunt humans? I don't think that that mindset is going to get you anywhere with Sasquatch. And I think pretty much if, if people go into the forest with that mindset, they're not going to get anything. I think that Sasquatch can just run circles around humans. And I think that I'm not saying that there may have been some that um, had the misfortune of being confronted with humans, but I truly believe that if a Sasquatch doesn't want to be found, they're not going to be found. This is not going to happen. And that's something that Loki told me, he made it very clear to me. So um, Loki also said that they, his group is, uh, they're time travelers. And that's when Loki started talking to me about the vortexes and told me about the, the problem that they're having with um, artificial portals being created for other alien groups coming in here. Um, that's just something that he told me about. And that's, that's very interesting. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, Loki told me that they are earth keepers and that his job is to go around different areas and to keep track of what's happening to the planet. He said that when there's problems, um, they, Sasquatch is very in tune with other species. It's not so much that Sasquatch goes and eats deer. Uh, or will eat other types of animals. Yeah, they do. But the different tribes, according to what Loki stated, um, have different things that that's, um, that is a part of who they are as a group. And I think that uh, he was stating that um, they watch Earth's history um, and they're, they're he said that they're um, pretty much are the, the, let's see, the watchers of Earth's history pretty much being her time clock and witness. So fortunately, um, I wrote all this down. So I, I have something to remember. Sometimes what happens when I have somebody who's communicating with me, and if it's not my information, and I've said this for years, I don't retain it because if it's not my, experience in life, I don't retain information, I have to write it down, especially if it's from somebody else. It's their information that I'm supposed to give. It's, it's not mine. So he was stating that, um, eh, let's see. Um, he said that they uh, try to keep an essential balance between their duties and obligations to the earth, to what they, they're supposed to be doing, by eluding man and his curiosity to hunt them. Sometimes chance encounters happen, creating unintentional and dangerous encounters with humans. As far as Loki knows, there have been no deaths on either side from such chance encounters. So that's one thing that not just Loki, but Warja, and it's been made very clear to me that they, the, the Sasquatch that have contacted me, they don't wanna hurt humans. They do everything possible not to have any dangerous encounters and they have made it very clear that they do not want, they don't want to get hurt and they don't want humans to get hurt. They just want to exist and live and do what and we want to exist and we want to live. The difference is that while they're more highly evolved as far as them understanding humans and who we are, we're not as highly evolved as them. And that's just the facts. Um, it, so, Loki was telling me that his particular group are 12 feet in height, 
to 17 feet. He, uh, let's see, uh, let's see. I, let me take that back. Look, he was telling me about another group. His group are not as tall. He is, he was eight feet tall. Um, and I did see him. He did come into um, Michael's. We were visiting his, his daughter um, back before he moved to uh, Oregon. And I did see Loki in her home. He did, he was standing uh, in a doorway and he's ducking his head down. And so I did see him. So um, he was tall. He's eight feet tall. Um, so um, and that's tall for me because I'm so short. But um, I think that the height of his group is eight to 10 feet tall is what he's telling me. Um, he is saying also that, um, He liked oranges as well. It's not just apples. Um, they um, definitely eat, they eat fish. They eat all kinds of, um, they forage. That's just what they do. They're good at it. He also stated that there is a very dangerous, uh, tall and large Sasquatch. Sasquatch um, and this type of Sasquatch is even dangerous for them. He said that they are from 12 feet in height to 17 feet. That's pretty tall. He said that when various tribes travel through out areas where these large Sasquatch dwell, they have to do so in careful and methodical ways. Males travel in small groups surrounding their families in order to divert any attention away from these giants. Loki said the large Sasquatch can be cannibalistic in nature. It just depends on the circumstances. So he said that fortunately for humans, that the large giants prefer to stay away from us. He said, in a very bizarre paradox, giants are revered by many of the Sasquatch tribes because they are considered sentient elders. By ancient um, clandestine laws known only to the Sasquatch. This basically means that the giants carry a lot of Earth's archaic history in their DNA. So I, I think that sometimes, um, down through history, obviously, I think some of these giants have been probably seen. And I think the Native Americans probably have been the groups that have seen them. But I believe that the Native Americans have learned to live with Sasquatch in ways that um, other groups haven't. And I think it's just because it's just not in anybody's, in their teachings, in their school, to, to even go outside the realm of humans. Humans think that, you know, the humans focus on humans. And I think that's a sad thing uh, because really in this world, there's so much that we don't know that we should really look at what's out there. And cryptids is a really good start for anybody who is trying, is, is thinking and open to looking outside themselves, outside the human realm of reality. Um, so, Let's see here. Um, Loki basically kept in contact with me. The first contact was in 2014. And that was really special for me because I, I just didn't have any idea much about cryptids. I was probably more in tune with Dogman because I think I actually had experienced Dogman a bit more up in Taos, New Mexico. And I, I'm pretty sure that uh, when I was working cattle up in various areas um, in Colorado and Arizona that I probably came close to Sasquatch um, with my horses uh, and various situations where you could feel and sense something was around you, but you just couldn't see it and my horses would get scared and skittish. And so I knew something was around. And the one thing is that when you've lived in the mountains long enough and you've, you've camped out in the mountains, um, and I used to camp out in a, a tent. And so it was a little precarious because you know, if something wanted to get in, it could get in. But I heard bear, I heard a lot of different other things too. And so I do know the, the difference in that feeling of if you sense a bear 
or a cougar coming towards you versus something else that is out there. And you know that if your dogs are growling and they're not willing to go outside the tent or outside wherever you're camped out at, you know that it's something that not even they want to, to deal with. And so uh, I just think that Sasquatch gets curious and just wants to kind of check out and see who's in the vicinity. Um, I think that the one thing that I loved about Loki is when he talked to me about portals. And what he did, which was really interesting, is he went into my mind and he gave me a beautiful image of all of these portal, these pyramids that were upside down spinning and they were they were spinning clockwise um and there were just thousands of pyramids and it just seemed like another galaxy another universe of pyramids and that's what they would do they would portal jump and they they knew how to go into each one of these portals and these pyramids which were upside down were portals and I think what was really cool about what he showed me was um, he said that it's something that uh, they're born with in their, their DNA. They're able to handle um, the pressure of, because I think there's a, a frequency pressure and change. I think, you know, like when you're up in a plane, how the pressure changes and, and it affects your ears or whatever you, the higher up you go, um, it just, it, it's a different type of existence, right? Because of the air is so cold and um, less oxygen, all that stuff. And so the same thing happens when, uh, obviously differently, of course, with portals. But he said that um, within each portal is an octagon mirage that gives off multiple pyramid shapes. Once they jump in the portals, he says that the multiple pyramids turn in all directions. It's like an illusion of several endless mirrors rotating at once. Loki said it can be very disorienting for humans because most humans haven't developed their pineal glands. Um, let's see. He also said that the natural portals affect areas around them within a mile of each direction. That includes up above, which is the sky and down below, which is towards Earth's center. At certain times of the day or night, the natural portals rotate and the octagon patterns shift. This is because Mother Earth adjusts for anything that is going in or coming out of the portals. He said the important aspect of the portals is that when the pyramids are pulling towards Middle Earth, this very action helps the Earth rotate. If an artificial portal is made, this changes the timing of the natural portals rotating. For instance, if aliens rip through and open or open up a portal either dimensionally or galactically, this is not good for the planet. The fabric of time and space has to come from the composition of the original source, meaning that the energy and frequency has a pulse that is like a blueprint. All beings who are natural portal jumpers, which are Sasquatch, have within their DNA Earth's blueprint. This means that if anything happens to the rotation of the portals, it can affect the portal jumpers biologically in a bad way, especially if they are in the portals at the same time, another artificial portal is ripping through. So uh, as you can see, it's not easy doing what he does and it can be a little dangerous. But he kind of showed me, um, he said it looks like just in these areas where these portals are it's smooth glass. It's almost like a stretching glass rainbow effect and he said, people see that. I mean, you can feel it too. It's a, it affects his, that's not even a word, affects his, it affects all the senses. It affects your hearing, your sight, your smell. It, it affects that sixth sense of, of knowing that something is a little bit different. Um, and uh, I remember at certain times that um, when I did experience this when I was working cattle, that um, I could smell change in the air. It was it was very electric, and it smelled like um, almost like wires burning, but a different kind of smell. It just kind of burned the inside of of my nose. I remember that, and um, I remember that um, it's just a very staticky kind of 
experience being out in the middle of nowhere and then having all these, these different sensations was a little bit crazy. But that has to do with maybe being in an area where there is a portal. Um, let's see here. He said that it's important to, it's, I, I wrote here, it's important to note that the artificial portals allow other dimensional beings mm -hmm and that otherwise could not come through the natural portals for the reason that most of the artificial portals have not been closed. We now have problems with biological beings called, and he's, he called them bionerts. I've never heard of that before. B-I-O-I-N-E-R-T-S. I guess is what he said. And he helps me spell stuff. So that's what he said, they, how they were spelled. Who naturally could not come here. They are like parasites, and Loki said they are very dangerous and destructive. He said that some of the bionerts are a problem for them as well, so humans aren't the only ones who have to defend themselves. Unfortunately, the artificial portals and the bionerts combined affect the natural process and encoding that Mother Earth goes through. The question at this point is how to close off the artificial portals once they open up. Since the artificial portals are dangerous to jump into, there's no way to know how to close them off from their point of origin, which that could be very scary. That's kind of like the dimensional walking that I was trained and learned to do because once I'm over in another dimension or wherever I go and it, things start getting closed off or I, be, I become more solid, how do I get back? So yeah, that can, that can be disconcerting to say the least. Given that artificial portals are foreign to Earth, their technology is also, is also of unknown origin. If Loki or any of the numerous portal jumpers decide to take on such a dangerous mission, you know, could they come back? I mean, that's just something that is a little scary. Um, and so this is also something, uh, again, another note of Loki, he said that the portals could get a unique component that gives off the slightest appearance of glass with multiple rainbows running through it. The frequencies that resonate within the portal itself bounce off each other and give off a harmonious hum that usually only animals can hear. My understanding is shamans and healers can also hear this hum, which is a sign of communion with the earth. So I think this happens with uh, the natural portals that are all over the planet. And I think that these portals are also around ley lines too. I think that has a lot to do with where you can probably find something very, very unusual. Um, so with that being said, as far as the, the portals, Loki did actually come back to me and he he did tell me um uh that there there was a resolution that they thought that they could figure out how to close off these artificial portals and it's it's almost like imagine cheesecloth that's been ripped open or or torn um it's like how do you do you sew that back up how, i mean do you what what do you do to make it back to how it naturally or normally was before it was torn. Normally what we do, we just toss that and get another cheesecloth or whatever. But you can't do that with these portals because it's, it's a tear that mother earth is dealing with and it's, it's not healthy. And so they have to go back through, he was telling me and figure out how to um, close them off. And if that means that they have to go in to figure out where the point of origin is um, and see how they calculated mathematically how to get here, then they, they're gonna have to figure that out. And Loki did contact, uh, made contact with me in Albuquerque just before Mike and I left to move to Utah. And he had an alien who was very unfriendly with him in actually extremely rude and asked Loki why he was even talking to me because he, he basically told me that um, I was, you know, he, his view of humans was very low. He just said, she's just a you know, stupid human. And I, I didn't like that at all, but, but this, and, and this alien um, was somebody I had never really seen much before. He, he didn't look like a gray. Um, 
he had a, a this is going to sound strange, a potato shaped head, um, kind of bigger up top and kind of curved in and then around the, the, the bottom part. Um, he wasn't a gray um, or white. He was kind of a, a, what would be the color, like a yellowish green color. Um, and he had, uh, he didn't have the, the eyes that were shaped like uh, grays with the, the black. He had kind of uh, eyes that um, were shaped like mine, except that the pupil was different and um, a really thin, thin neck. But uh, that was very, very strange. Um, but anyways, he was a mathematician. Um, and an, it, I, from what Loki had told me, it was a math that we don't have here yet. It's not something that we, that anybody does here. So they had figured out with another alien group that there's a possibility to actually fix these rips because the rips, if there's too many of them, affect the natural portals. So if you wondered if Sasquatch works with aliens, the answer is yes, they do. There's people who have seen Sasquatch around UFOs. They've seen Sasquatch get into UFOs. They've seen Sas Sasquatch um, actually with other alien groups. Uh, they've seen UFOs leave and they've seen Sasquatch walking you know, into the forest right after it leaves. So I think it's obvious that Sasquatch has a relationship um, and works with aliens. I don't know which group. I don't know who this alien was that Loki brought to meet me, but he wanted to let this alien guy know that, um, and it was he was male, that um, I was an empath and that he was talking with me. And <laughs> anyways, I think I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed either. So we didn't we didn't get along very good. So that's one thing that I will say that um, yes, they work with aliens, and that's that's a for sure. That's what Loki told me. Um, Loki told me about a very interesting um, vortex, and it, it, he calls it the traveling ghost vortex. And I think I talked about this. Uh, a while back in one of the other videos where I'd, I'd written about it. But he said that these are different. And I'm just going to read here what he told me. The traveling ghost can be called upon by Sasquatch jumpers and other elementals for a variety of needs. The one difference of this vortex than the portals is that it has an intelligence to it. The traveling ghost has a connection to each other. And I think there were three. He said there's three that are. Um, are here on this planet, and they are aware of where each other resides at any given time. The ancient ones of the forest say this particular vortex has an energy frequency that is from another planet similar to Earth. I think this other planet has been extinct for a long time, and because of this, especially with Earth being so similar to their original home, the traveling ghosts reside um, here on Earth. From what I understand, they, come, they came here uh, millennia ago, so they've been around a long time from what um, Loki said. The traveling ghost has a mathematical formula to it that makes them alien in a technological way. From what Loki says, they are hard to figure out and they change with time just as anything here on this planet does. Um, this means the calculations change in how and when to use them, which means that in order to use them, um, they the Sasquatch have to have that connection with them and they have to, uh, update how they work and use, obviously, the vortexes. Um, I don't, I think with there only being three, they don't use them a lot, but I think they do have a relationship with them. So um, uh, he said that um, the traveling ghosts are, let's see here, Loki show me in my mind's eye, a little of what it's like to be inside a traveling ghost. I pretty much got a really bad headache and didn't like it. It was like being inside a tunnel with me twirling a thousand spins a second with light air and something I can't explain, almost like a loud engine exploding in my ears. My frequency just couldn't even come close to what was necessary to connect 
that type of intelligence. If I ever get pulled into one of these things, I don't think I would be sane. Probably wouldn't be alive. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just kind of felt like uh, my mind was turned into mush when he was trying to show me. It was just way, way, way too much. I just um, it's not. I'm not evolved enough to be able to handle it. So that tells me that Sasquatch is very highly evolved, much more than humans. Um, I think that we have to understand and respect that if you, if a person wants to have contact with Sasquatch, understand that you are dealing with a very intelligent group of beings and to give them respect. Um, and this is just my opinion. If, if you're looking for any kind of evidence of Sasquatch and you're looking only at footprints because they, they leave footprints when they walk. And if, if you're looking for footprints, they'll give it to you. And that's all you'll ever find. If you're looking for a relationship with them, that's a little bit different. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with pouring casts and getting the, the, the casts of their footprints. But if that becomes more important than the actual research, if that, that for people is the evidence that they're constantly looking for, then they're, they're kind of missing the, po the, the, the boat because it's not about just that type of evidence. It's about trying to establish some kind of connection and communication with them. Michael and I um, are the type of researchers where it's just really, it, it's, I'm, we go into the forest knowing that they live there. And um, if by chance we get some kind of contact with them, then we're really grateful and we let them know that. Um, I think I, Michael and I went to a conference a couple of years ago where a researcher was talking about how important the cats are and all that stuff. And yes, they are very important. But if that's just your main focus and that's just something that you, you're always looking for, again, Sasquatch is always listening and always watching and they're, they're gonna give you what you, you ask for. Um, I, I think we have to understand that they want a little bit more than that. They, um, they want a, a relationship with humans. And I, I think that the more that we understand this, I think the safer it'll be in the force because I think Sasquatch will let us know when it's time to leave, when we need to stay out of a, 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 a location or a situation or whatever, they'll tell us when to go. So I think that's really, when you know you've really made a good connection with Sasquatch is when you, you, you can actually relate with someone who says, hey, you know what? Mm, you don't wanna be in this area. It's not a good location for you. And you follow your gut and you leave. So I think also when you get those feelings, it can also be from, Sasquatch as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think that it's important to have uh, an alliance with Sasquatch. I, I think that it, it, we have to have that respect with understanding that, that the forest is where they live. And I think that like, for instance, uh, Michael and I actually went to Sasquatch Highway a couple of years ago, and the why it's called Sasquatch Highway, it's, I don't even remember, it's, I guess it's Highway 224. Um, and it's, I think it's the road going from Estacada to Detroit Lake. So we, we used to go walking that area before the, the fires hit last year. And when we went out there, we used to take apples and we used to take chocolate and nuts and whatever. And one of the first times that we went out there, we actually got followed and it was by something bipedal because we knew that um, as we were walking, we would, we both would be walking and we were listening to something that was up to the left and up on this, this rocky, this, this area that was a lot of of ferns and trees and some rocks. And as we were walking, we could hear something bipedal walking, but we couldn't see it. And then I would say, stop, let's stop. And we'd stop. And then it would walk a few steps beyond what we did. 
And so it was doing that constantly. So we both sensed and felt that we were being followed and it wasn't by something that was scary. Now, the, the one thing is because we do follow David Politis' um, Missing 411 and we, we, I, we watch his channel and we, he, he's a good guy to follow. We're a little more weary and aware of the, the forest in um, kind of a, a scary way because of the, the missing people that have actually, um, the, the stories of the missing people that he talks about. And it's very sad. So we try to be very careful when we go we let everybody know that we're where we're going and the location and whatever. But um, so that kind of entered our minds too a little bit. It's like, oh God, what is this? But we knew that it was Sasquatch because we got that sense that it was Sasquatch. And so we decided to leave a couple apples and some, some candy, um, just basically as an introduction into saying, hey, we know you're there and we're friends and we want to be friendly and get to know you, that kind of thing. This particular Sasquatch just didn't really seem to reciprocate. Um, he's just more curious. And it might have been a young Sasquatch. I think it might have been a juvenile. And, and I got that feeling from him. Because the older Sasquatch, they they pretty much are very confident and they're not as, as weary of humans. And so um, he seemed this one seemed to be a little bit more weary. But we were aware of him being there, and we were aware that this may be an area that the Sasquatch walks all the time. Um, and I know this, uh, Michael knows this. Um, it's just it, they can be visible or invisible. If they don't want you to see them, they're not going to be seen. Um, they can, you know, hide, but they also can actually really be invisible. And there's people, there are many stories out there, people who swear by what they saw that actually saw them disappear. So um, they have this ability. And I think that just knowing that there's beings out there in the force that have this ability, you have to you know, be respectful because they, they're not always gonna show themselves to you, but they might be around you and might be watching you. And I think I wrote an article a while back and I, I think I was um, kind of getting a little irritated at people who were camping and then saying, oh, something terrible was following them or watching them or whatever. And I, I titled it, there are no grocery stores in the forest. And, and the reason why I titled my article that, is because if people camp in an area where a Sasquatch goes hunting, but yet you're camped there and maybe they don't want you camped there, the best way that they can, the best thing they can do to, to let you know that you're, you're really kind of messing things up here is to not make it comfortable for you. So if you ever get an uncomfortable feeling about a location that you're camped at, it's not, I don't think necessarily that something horrible and evil is out there. It's probably Sasquatch saying, hey, get the heck out of here because this is where I, I hunt. This is where I get food for my family because they have families just like we have families. And so I think that it's, I was just, hearing a lot of different stories of people saying something scary is out there and watching us and this and that. And I really think that if a person is empathic, that Sasquatch is going to know that and they're going to go to your gut and they're going to just say, hey, you know what? Uh, you need to go. This is, this is not a good place for you to be. And maybe they're saving you too. Maybe there's something else there that is scary, is dangerous for you. And they're trying to warn you. So there are more, there are more variables for your safety in listening to your gut on the positive side than on the negative. So if you don't listen to your gut and you stay somewhere where you you feel like something's watching you, you don't feel good, you feel this, you feel that, well, then you know what? You're gonna 
you're, you're going to find out what it is that your gut was trying to tell you. And sometimes that's not a good thing. Sometimes if you don't listen to your gut, some scary and horrible stuff can happen. So you have to follow your gut. You just have to. Um, I, I think it's important to understand that when we go fishing, you know, and hunters go hunting, um, whatever it is that, that we're competing with Sasquatch and any other animal that, and not, not that Sasquatch is an animal, I'm just saying the wild animals that live in the forest, we're competing with them as well. And so everybody has, you know, kind of their, their way of, of going after whatever it is they're trying to hunt. But if you ever walk in an area or, or you're located in an area that you don't feel good and comfortable with, then you leave. It's just that simple. And I think that's kind of the message that Sasquatch has tried to tell people for years is that we have that gut feeling. We also, if, if we're open enough to it and we can work our pineal gland, we can have that, that sense that tells us what's dangerous and what's not. And so please listen to it. Um, we need to be safe in the forests. And I don't think that Sasquatch is going to be a problem. I don't think that, that what people encounter, when, usually when people say rocks are being thrown um, or they can hear something yelling, that's just Sasquatch saying, hey, get out. And you know what? You listen and you get out. Um, I'm not saying that there's there might be a couple rogue um, Sasquatch out there that could you know, possibly hurt someone. But I think if you listen to your gut instinct and it tells you to get out of a location, you just get out. I think we can all be in the force safely. We just have to be aware of what's out there. And from what I, I know, from what Sasquatch has told me, like if you're in an area that's dangerous for you for one reason or another, and your 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 gut is is you're not feeling good, and your gut instinct says to to go, then you listen to it because that can be us telling you you need to go, and it can be just something's there that um, is dangerous for you. Be aware of vortexes. I think that there's there's some things like the traveling ghosts that travel around. Um, and they travel, there's some that travel up in the air, and then there's others that are on the ground that just float along the ground. And I, I think that um, there's a possibility that if somebody isn't watching what they're doing, if they don't feel the, their environment, that you know, they can walk into a portal you know, somewhere or a vortex. So we just have to be aware of the surroundings, just like we are in the city. There's no difference. You just have to make sure that you're safe. So I just wanted to put that out there that I think Sasquatch wants us to be safe. Sasquatch doesn't necessarily want anything bad happening to humans. They don't want to be hunted. And I think anybody who wants to hunt a Sasquatch um, is going to be is going to come up empty handed because you're not going to get a relationship or evidence that way with a Sasquatch by hurting them or wanting to hurt them. They're going to stay away from you and they're smart enough and they're, they're more evolved than humans. So they're going to be able to do it. So that's just my take on Sasquatch. I just wanted to kind of put that out there because there's been a few things that have bothered me. Um, let's not call them boogers, people. Let's call them Sasquatch. I mean, if you want to call them Bigfoot, fine. They've been called that for a long time. But have a little respect for them. When you're out in the forest, if you're out with family and you're going camping, be aware of your surroundings. Michael and I, when we go out and we go hiking, we'll take a few snacks and we'll just leave an apple here, an apple there. And even if Sasquatch doesn't take the apples, we know some, some animal in the forest will enjoy it. So we try to leave little gifts when we go out there and we try to be respectful that there are other beings out in the forest that live there. And that if we're visiting someone's home, we try to leave it in the best possible um, condition than when we, we went there. So thanks for listening to me.
this is just a little bit of a my my thoughts on Sasquatch. And well, if you have any thoughts and ideas or comments, please leave them. You can write us at dimensionalwalking at gmail.com. And so happy Friday. Happy Wednesday, I should say. Not happy Friday, happy Wednesday. And um, if you guys um, have any ideas on Sasquatch that you want to add to this, just please feel free to do it. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing anything that you guys have to say because I think we need to bring the Sasquatch topic out more for people to here and if we do then that brings Sasquatch into the mindset of people that maybe you know they'll live and let live I think that's the message here live and let live so you all take care and we'll see you again on another Wednesday even though I said Friday hey who knows maybe we'll do Wednesday Fridays Mondays maybe down the line if we get enough people 